And welcome to We're Not Really Here. This is the show that brings you as close to Manchester City as both you and we are currently allowed. It is City's second game of the restart following the coronavirus pandemic against the team that have had to wait the longest to get going again. That is Burnley. You just saw Pep Guardiola arrive at the Etihad. These are the pictures of a much changed team arriving for City against Burnley. Eight changes in all, in all made by Pep Guardiola. Uh, Sergio Aguero's back, Bernardo Silva is back as well, and Phil Foden are all in the team. Uh, seven of the eight who aren't starting, I've made the bench, with, of course, Eric Garcia coming back from that concussion from the first game against Arsenal. So much to look forward to for an eight o'clock kickoff in the Premier League this evening. We will do everything that we possibly can to keep you up to date with everything that's going on at the Etihad while we cannot be here. I am really in my spare room and Natalie Pavelek is really in her front room, which I can say Natalie is always dressed like that. It just so happens. Yes, this is, is the usual way today, I like to right? keep my living room. Yes, I am sat in my living room and I do need to warn you that next to me is my dog, Sergio, obviously named after Sergio Aguero, and he is massively snoring away. So he obviously thinks I'm very boring, but so if you can hear that, it is my <laughs> dog, Sergio. But yes, Hugh and I and guests are going to be here with you all the way up until kickoff. And then we're also going to be straight back with you after the full-time whistle for immediate reaction. Now, for the Arsenal game, thousands of you, literally thousands of you got in touch with us and we loved it. We want to see your pictures. What's your setup like at home? We want to hear your comments about the game. We want to see your predictions about the game. So you can get in touch with us by using the hashtag WNRH. Now, of course, yesterday was Father's Day, so this is also a great chance for you to get a shout out to all the city dads out there. And I specifically want to see your Father's Day city gifts. I want to see what you gave your dad that was city related. And hopefully, maybe we might be getting one of you live with us on the show. Uh, well, I hope that you uh, delivered on behalf of both your son, Natalie, and indeed for your own father as well. We'll talk a little bit more about how the restart has been enjoyed by not just Manchester City fans, but everybody indeed as well as the Premier League now enters uh, nearly a week down. And this is the Manchester City starting lineup for the game. Eight changes I mentioned. Only three players from the Arsenal game get to keep their place. That is Edison, David Silva and Riyad Mahrez. We expect Edison to be in goal then. Cancelo, Fernandinho, Otamendi and Zinchenko are completely changed back four in front of Edison. Rodri will be the pivot with, we expect Bernardo Silva and David Silva to be the two attacking midfielders ahead of him. Riyad Mahrez keeps his place to the right-hand side. We expect Phil Foden to play in a narrow left-hand side position and Sergio Aguero is up front and back in the side. Nine in nine against Burnley for Sergio Aguero. As far as the substitutes are concerned, as I said, seven of the eight who dropped from the team on Wednesday night are on the bench. A, a bigger bench, as is as normal, of course. Scott Carson, Kyle Walker, Raheem Sterling, uh, Ilke Gundogan, Gabriel Jesus, Imeric Laporte, uh, Kevin De Bruyne, Leroy Sané and Benjamin Mendy as well. Uh, so that is the Manchester City team. We'll bring the Burnley team as well in just a moment. But let us introduce a little bit of grit to the sophistication that Natalie has already introduced us to this evening. And we're not really here. Yes, it is time to have not only a scrappy striker, but also a tenacious box-to-box -box midfielder. We could have them both going on our best select 11. So let's speak to Michael Brown first. Michael, a very good evening uh, to you. How much have you enjoyed what you've seen so far? Not only the Premier League, but also of Manchester City. Perhaps we'll talk about uh, generally the Premier League. It's been a strange well, been old situation, strange. hasn't I mean, it? One thing I would say, Hugh, is um, you know, we have been looking forward to it. It's been anticipated for some time and it was exciting, but... It's just not the same, is it? You know, the games, it's great to be back watching football again, but without their fans, the supporters, that having that atmosphere. Um, you can see as well, some of the some of the games are a little bit sort of tentative, people finding their way. And I expect that from the players. It's going to take a little bit of time to, to actually adapt, to actually get up to tempo after missing so much football. But, you know, Manchester City especially, you know, they created the goals, created a little bit of excitement, but some of the games have really sort of started not so great. 
I've been fascinating. Uh, to, have you gone with the fake crowd noise or have you gone with the real sense of what the game is all about? Because some of the fake crowd noise, each broadcaster, I think, has a slightly different way of doing it. Some of them are actually pretty good at doing it. But what, as a former footballer, Michael, have you preferred to have in terms of your watching at home experience? I'd like to see it with no background noise. I'd love to hear what everybody's saying. I'm not sure, actually, we'd, we'd have to have a bleep, bleep, bleep across the bottom of the... Um, the bottom of the across the, the the TV screens or whatever because the language would be quite bad. It would get quite heated. But you know, listen, it's it's just strange having a little bit of noise and then there's a, there's a delay when we're seeing a strike and then a, a noise and it's. But listen, it's just what it is. We've got to get used to it. It's just great that it's even back. So you now, hopefully tonight it'll be a little bit better. In Manchester City's second game and obviously it's going to be tough for Burnley. That's still their first one. Uh, yeah, Natalie, you've, you you didn't actually miss football that much. So I guess that you're pleased that it's back. Yeah, I think like a lot extent. of people, when they when it first um, restart came back, I was a bit like, oh, really? With, like, with the, sort of the, the difficult sort of lockdown that my family had had and a lot of family had had. But then as the day got closer, the more excited I got. And then come Wednesday night, I was really excited. And, you know, it was, I really, really enjoyed it. I really, I really love having football back. And I've fully gone for the crowd noise. Um, and I do think it's quite funny on some of the games, you could, there's a boo crowd crowd noise have you heard it like it's amazing so yeah I mean I'm absolutely absolutely thrilled that it goes back uh well you can see that Paul Dickoff has, has joined us Paul considering how many times you were booed as a player do you appreciate the fact that some of the people on the television coverage have been able to time a boo perfectly for either a yellow card they don't enjoy from the referee or just some some player they don't have particularly high up on their list of priorities <laughs> A lot of the time, but no, I quite like <laughs> I don't believe it. Noise. I don't um, believe you know, it. When we done the game last week, I tried to um, uh, do both and, and put it with just the players, and it didn't seem quite right. So um, I think they've done quite well. The crowd noise, but with all the, I think it was a Southampton game the other day. There, Southampton Norwich, for the second goal where um, Southampton had already scored. Then there was a delay about ten seconds before they put the cheering in. So I think they've got to get the timing right ever so slightly, but. Hey, look, I'm just glad it's back. Um, you know, enjoyed doing the show last week um, and looking forward to tonight because I thought the game against Arsenal after the first 10-15 minutes, I thought we were magnificent. You know, you look at a lot of the games since then, a lot of clubs have really struggled. Um, you know, there's been a really slow start for them, but, you know, City being City hit the ground running last week and expect more tonight. Yeah, perhaps we'll talk a little bit later on about how the lack of crowd is affecting more widely the Premier League at the moment. But uh, you're right, Manchester City seem to enjoy it, certainly uh, in any circumstance on Wednesday night when they beat Arsenal by three goals to nil. Now it's Burnley. And uh, Natalie, we uh, know that Pep Guardiola has made that those eight changes and we're going to go from yes, one thank manager you very much. to you another are now manager. going to be joined by another former City player, a teammate of both the guys you can see on the screen, also a former Burnley player, but most excitingly, the new manager of Manchester City women's team. Please welcome Gareth Taylor. Hi, Gareth. How are you doing? Are you OK? Yes, I'm really good. I mean, first of all, we've just got to say an absolutely huge congratulations on the new role. How are you feeling? Yeah, thank you. I mean, amazing. Just so happy. Um, obviously, really kind of strange circumstances. The process was obviously different being it started previously to lockdown and then during lockdown with many meetings in this kind of format. So it was a strange experience, but a great one. And, um, and again, just really looking forward now to uh, getting back out onto the to the pitch and, and working hard to, to try and achieve our objectives for, for next season will be, obviously, with the season finishing. And of course, we know that leagues around the world all dealt with the lockdown situation differently. Of course, some of the leagues um, ended using the points per game basis and the Premier League, of course, has restarted. The The Women's League was one of those that ended early and did a points um, per game basis, which actually ended up resulting in, in, in us coming second when um, we were top of the league going into the lockdown. But of course, Chelsea had a game in hand on us. How have you found, how have your team reacted to that? Have you spoken to them? How have they dealt with it? I think there would have been potentially some disappointment, but, you know, we had many conversations with, uh, with the FA. Um, we were made fully aware of the possible outcomes. And then on the back of that, uh, when it was made the decision, that was it. You know, the most important thing for us, of course, we, we would have wanted to be champions. And would have been interesting to see if we'd have played out the remaining games. But 
the most important thing is is the European qualification, which is the top two places. So you know we've got into that, and um, yeah, again, hopefully next season we'll be able to play out the season fully and uh, and do our bit. And can you tell us anything? Have you got any idea yet when we might be seeing the women's team training or the league coming back at all? Well, there's been so many processes and um, kind of estimated dates. I mean, now the fact that the, the Women's League will start um, around the 5th or 6th of September um, gives us something really to go at in terms of what our pre-season would look like. And it's going to be quite a, a tapered pre-season to what we would have had previously. So there'll be no going away abroad to play in a nice climate. We're going to have to make do. And I say make do. We've got an unbelievable facility at uh, CFA. So we're having to tweak things a little bit, but um, we're making sure we prepare and give ourselves the correct amount of time, the correct amount of games that are needed to hit the ground running during this, uh, the start of the season. Uh, perhaps a good idea to bring in Paul Dickoff and Michael Brown, former teammates of uh, Gareth, because I, I know Gareth has been rising through the ranks at Manchester City, but... Um, Paul and Michael, did you ever think he had what it takes? You often have amongst your teammates, oh, this guy's going to be a good manager. And half the rest of the time, you're thinking, this guy will be rubbish. So which yeah, did we'll Gareth fall into? Paul, perhaps you can tell us first. Can... <laughs> <laughs> That's it, this big thing. No, I've always looked at um, Gareth and myself are, are family friends. So, you know, watching them through the, the, the ranks with the academy and building his way up to the brilliant job he's done with the 18s, I think he's always, he's w always wanted to have that next big step and he's been ready for it. You know, he's... Um, he, he knows the city way of playing football. Um, he'll be, I would imagine, that he'll be a fantastic man manager, woman manager. I don't know what the right term is for that, you know, because he's been there, seen it, and done it. And um, it's not, it's not surprised me at all because even as a player, that Gareth was quite vocal um, in the changing room about um, about how the team played and, and very tactically astute as well. So no, I'm buzzing for the big man. You know, he'll do a fantastic job. Uh, Michael, does that ring, ring true? Because I know both you and Paul have had a little bit of a dabble, but not currently uh, fancying that line of attack in terms of your career. But Gareth is uh, doing that. Uh, any any pitfalls for him to avoid well, as he he's makes his way into the women's feet, team for as now? As you've just said, myself and Paul have seen different problems that come along the way with management side. But, but what I do know and what I should say about Gareth over the last few years, going down to CFA and, and speaking to people about the level of commitment that he's put into this role. And I was even saying... Every time I go to see him, so when did you get here this morning, Gareth? How long have you done today? What have you done this week? Just incredible amount of desire and hours that he's put in. But he always wanted a, a main manager role. And I'm so pleased that he's finally got this opportunity to do it. And I'm sure he'll go on and, and do a fantastic job because that's what he is as a true professional. I mean, he'll put his heart and soul into it for sure. Uh, now, we just showed you some footage that uh, a lot of City fans will be very familiar with. We always tend to talk to Paul Dickov about Gillingham 1999. Michael Brown got taken off after an hour, so we're not going to ask him. So perhaps we could talk uh, to Gareth Taylor, because Gareth, you came on with five minutes of normal time to go. And look what happened in extra time. And, uh, you know, significant entrance, yeah, I would imagine, crazy, for you on really, that day. Yeah, just crazy, really, when you think about that whole experience. And, um, you know, it was... Talking to, I mean, we got together last year on the 20 year anniversary. So I was with Mike and, and Paul um, at the Etihad and we, we celebrated it and it was really nice. But um, I don't think we actually really knew the kind of real significance of that game at that time. We knew obviously it was a step up into the championship for us. And, and uh, you know, we were under real pressure to make that step. And then we got promoted again the following season. So I don't think, I think it was. It was a significant step, but no one really could kind of see how important that that promotion was, um, and and the fact that people are still talking about it now, you know, many years later. <laughs> well, Paul Dickov is, but uh, uh, he's got a quota, and we're not allowed to talk to him about it every single time. And just one one other thing about that day and, and the surrounding time and the era that, that, that Manchester City were undergoing at that time, huge changes. Uh, but there was one constant, and that was Joe Royal. How significant in the way that he and Willie Donachie, uh led that team? How much have you used that as an influence in what you do, Gareth? On the we can see there. I'm just looking at the images. Hopefully, there's a there's a little bit that's rubbed off. But yeah, I mean, Joe was. Um, was great in, in most situations. He was really comfortable speaking to players, dealing with players. 
Um, and he had kind of opposite the opposite in, in Willie. But I really got on well with Willie because he was my coach at Sheffield United and he played a big part of me coming across to Manchester City. So it was that little bit of a familiar face when I arrived there. And he, um, you know, that team that of those two, plus, you know, I have to say four or five of the other staff who were there at the time, you know, we had some amazing characters. And I always say about the team as well. So we had the really good coaching staff and technical staff. But the team, the, the playing staff that we had was not necessarily good with kind of big names or stars. Um, we had real good quality. And, you know, the likes of Paul and, and Michael went on to have like brilliant careers. Um, but it was everyone bought into the team ethic and, and the culture and uh, everybody put them, they put the team before themselves, which is obviously something that I've tried to take now and into my coaching career because we're obviously we're in a, a team environment. We're not an individual sport. And um, regardless, unless you've got a Lionel Messi in your team, you're going to need the team to perform. So, you know, you need everyone kind of understanding their role and responsibility within it. And one of the people who doesn't get enough of the credit for 1999 in that playoff uh, final against Gillingham was, of course, Natalie Pavelek, nay Pike, because you were there proving that it is a team effort, Natalie. So perhaps we should pay, pay more attention to the, the effort that you yeah, thank you very much. Sure, I was in the crowd. I was a 15 year old girl that day. And I'm happy to tell you all that I did not leave. <laughs> I would not let my family leave. So I saw everything. I saw the magic Paul Dickoff moment live. Um, but gents, as City fans, we will never, ever tire of saying thank you to you. And we'll never tire of hearing about um, the stories from back then because without you all we wouldn't be where we are today and today of course is the Premier League a game against Burnley and while we have you Gareth of course as a former Burnley player and also as a manager I'd love to get um, your opinion on how you think so Sean Dyche has done I mean he, he just seems to be you know doing remarkable with Burnley all the time what's your impression of him? I think Burnley are really fortunate to have him I mean um, they had obviously real success in terms of retaining their Premier League status over a number of years now. And, and the time that they did drop out of it, he got them straight back up. He's a great character and he, he's as good for Burnley as Burnley is for him. I mean, obviously he's going to be high, you know, in high demand and rightly so because of the job that he's done there on a, you know, on a relatively low budget. And, um, you know, knowing a lot of Burnley supporters like I do, they're really delighted that they have him. He seems to pull a rabbit out of the hat every season. Even this season, they looked in trouble at one point, but he put together a run of uh, unbeaten in seven games, won four of them just before lockdown. So um, he's done amazing and uh, the club are really lucky to have him. And looking back, of course, um, at the result from, from midweek and also looking at the squad that we are uh, playing with right now, you must be really proud of the part that our youngsters are playing, of course, with Garcia starting, um, Phil Foden starting tonight, but also Taylor Harwood-Bellis and Tommy Doyle um, have been in the squad this season. So how proud are you? Yeah, I mean, it's not easy. It's really tough for these lads to break through. And you've seen that with Phil, who's uh, a real precocious talent. Um, really ticks a lot of boxes in, in, in any, and he was a pleasure for me to, to work with for three years. Eric, similar, great lad, came from a different environment um, and, you know, has, has just gone into things seamlessly. So these lads have got a really good opportunity and they're working with a top, top manager, one of the, one of the if not the very best that I've seen. And um, they have to be at it on every single day. And, and you know, if they're not, then they're going to be straight back across to the other side, back to the academy. So, They've uh, they've got a great platform. Um, there's a lot of support there for them. And uh, like you say, it's great to see Academy lads getting through. And, and especially in this team, when you look at the team tonight and the changes that are made, it's amazing that um, you've got the, that luxury of kind of two players in every position who are top class players. So for those lads to be competing within that is just amazing. Well, Gareth, it's been great to have uh, you on. We're not, not really here this evening. Uh, thank you very much. Congratulations on your new job. And next time, if you are preparing any of the youngsters to perhaps play at centre-back when Edison comes rushing out, you can make sure they know to get out of the way in the future exactly, because yeah. Eric Garcia learned that lesson pretty firmly, didn't he, the other night? Although it is good to see that he is recovering after suffering a concussion. Uh, just really the one player out of all those who appeared on Wednesday night who isn't involved this evening for those uh, obvious reasons. Gareth, had a good luck. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks for joining us back. 
with uh, the guys in just a second. But first time to remind ourselves, yes, it's that long ago, back in December, when City went to Turf Moor, often tough, but came away with four. It was a quick release from the Brazilian. Kevin De Bruyne goes down. The referee allows play to continue. De Bruyne is struggling. Gabriel Jesus lines up a shot. It's a curling effort into the net. Jesus beats Pope. And that one will count. A delightful strike from Gabriel Jesus. Uh, so I'll chat about Roger and Foden briefly and then throw to Edison and thereafter Nat picks up for a section. Shuffle inside, that swung over and sent into the net for Gabriel Jesus, his second. His movement was perfect there, Bernardo Silva waited, picked him out with the cross. And it's a delicate touch from Gabriel Jesus to double City's advantage. in with class by you, Angelino, you, you, it comes you, back you. out to David Silva, sells a dummy to the defence. Um, and that is a rocket from right? Rodrigo! 3-0! Yeah, and then all the keeper gets a hand to it, but there was no keeping that out. Yeah, I'll go to Edison. Bill, stop man, mate. See you soon, buddy. Thanks, call Gareth, for a thanks, shot, and that one finds its way in. Riyad Mahrez stakes his claim for a start in the Manchester derby. Burnley nil, Manchester City four. This one goes loose. City trying to keep the clean sheet, and they do not manage to do so. Burnley get a consolation goal. And Burnley won, Manchester City four. And that's how it ended at Turf Moor, a particularly impressive result. If you consider uh, the only time that City have lost to Burnley over the course of the last, what, half decade has been at Turf Moor. And uh, as things go at the Etihad uh, for the Blues, they are imperious against uh, Burnley. You've just got to ask the Burnley fans who uh, trudge up there and please that it's behind closed doors perhaps tonight because they don't have to witness what has been a tough visit for them. Uh, over the years. We're going to spend the next couple of minutes talking about a couple of players who are in the team uh, tonight for Manchester City. Uh, two of eight changes made by Pep Guardiola. I'll remind you of the two teams in just a moment. But first of all, let's talk about Rodri. This is a player, a significant signing for Manchester City, of course, over the summer uh, last year. And he is playing in that crucial position for Pep Guardiola. The number six, the pivot. And that goal against Burnley, a real feature of what Rodgers produced so far over the course of his first season uh, with the Blues. So, um, Michael, I'm going to come to you because you are, of course, <laughs> the midfielder of the four of us. Um, Natalie, very much a fullback in her playing days. Uh, Paul Dickov, a striker, uh, joining us on We're Not Really Here this evening ahead of Manchester City against Burnley. So tell us a little bit about the role and how crucial it is to Pep Guardiola's system, Michael, and, and how Rodri as a player fits it to the extent that City were willing to pay so much money for him. The, the person who probably suffered the most by Rodri being at the football club would be Fernandinho who I thought was for many seasons now has been the master of that holding role you just watch that unselfishness that timing of the tackle just wants to be part of the team so that's what Rodri needs to do so I think he's he's done well but I still think there's time for, you know, for him to improve he's got to possibly I don't know just pick up the pace slightly he's got to be uh, just make his awareness and I think after Fernandinho, it's a hard one to follow. Obviously, Fernandinho's age now is is going away from him. So, you know, in an ideal world, it'd be great to him to to pick up after 
well, watching Fernandinho play, but it's hard. I don't think Pep sees Fernandinho now of starting week in, week out in that holding role. So we're going to see more of Rodri as we've seen Fernandinho drop into a centre half role. Uh, Paul, Paul is crucial, isn't he? Because uh, not only, and we've said it about Fernandinho over the years, haven't we? We've said it about Pep Guardiola teams before. Xavi comes to mind, Thiago at Bayern Munich as well. There are players who are not only important to what's going on behind them, but what's going on in front of them as well. And it takes a certain intelligence yeah, of players to be able to succeed he's, in he's doing that. He's such an intelligent footballer, you know, and I think um, talking about the players Pep's had in that position before, the fact that what you've just said there, that he's... Um, the minutes on the pitch is maybe only Raheem Sterling, so it shows you how important he thinks he is. And you know, when players come in for big money, I think people expect them to hit the ground straight away. But I think a lot of people forgot that he's he's only twenty three, you know. And I think he's he's done ever so well. He was twenty three when he signed to come in. And the one thing he does do is his his game management's fantastic, you know. And um, Pet wants that holding midfielder to be able to drop into the back four at times. We've, we've seen him playing in there. Um, earlier on in the season playing the back three so he's got the versatility for it as well but he, he retains the ball whether it's a five yard pass whether it's a ten yard pass or whether he's sitting a longer one you know he always makes sure that he takes care of the ball and City with, with the possession game that they play um, and the attacking players that they've got they need somebody in there that, that's going to feed them the ball and as I said he, he keeps it simple a lot of the times which is what I like you know he doesn't overcomplicate his game and and you need we've seen that over the last years, like Michael was saying before. You know, Fernandinho has been an unsung, been an unsung hero in there. Uh, we're going to move on to another player now, and that is uh, Phil Foden, a player who, of course is coming into the reckoning more and more and is likely to do so over the course of the last nine games of the season because of the close proximity of all of the fixtures. He is a player back in the side. He had 25 minutes or so on Wednesday night, got the third goal. And Natalie, from a, a, a fan's point of view, and it's always worth hearing the fan's point of view on somebody who's come uh, through the academy the system so the vaunted as it is, Phil Foden contributing in a way that you hope that he might, and indeed particularly over the course of yeah, the next Yeah, absolutely. What, five weeks I mean, or so. we, 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 we love Phil because to us, Phil is one of our own. Obviously, he's from Stockport. Um, he, he's a City fan. His family are blues. He's grown up with City. So to us, it's like seeing our dream happen on the pitch. Um, you know, not, he's also an absolutely incredible player. And we've been saying now for, for a few years, you know, at least for this, the whole of this season since we learned that David Silva was going to be leaving, that Phil was going to be an heir apparent to David Silva. Um, and just the sort of the, the few performances that we get from him, it just really reaffirms that. I mean, he's got so, so much energy. Um, you know, he, he's, he's just, he, he's incredible. Um, and yes, like you say, the fans, we love him. Now, also, Hugh, just quickly, um, on Rodri, I think it's important, we've learned our lesson before, that we should say happy birthday to Rodri as well, because it is his 24th birthday today. And as I say, we've learned that. <laughs> Uh, yes, 24 years young. That's infuriating how uh, some of the young players are prospering at such early ages. Uh, Natalie, Paul and Michael, thank you very much. Back to them in just a moment. But first of all, uh, let's hear from Edison, who's been telling us all about the fact that uh, squad rotation is hugely important over the course of the project restart in the Premier League. After completing his first 90 minutes of Premier League football in three months, we caught up with Edison after he helped his team to a comprehensive 3 0 win over Arsenal. Agora falando de, de jogo, tá? Bo bom tá de volta? Bom demais. O time não via a hora, né, de, de, de ter logo a, o primeiro jogo assim, porque, querendo não, três meses é, é muito, muito, muito tempo. É. Um jogador só fica parado <risos> três meses quando tem uma lesão. Então é. É muito difícil você ficar tanto tempo longe assim do sem treinar, sem aquela rotina de treino, depois jogo, viagem. É, mas é bom estar de volta. Do you want me to do the link about Citizens Giving? It always takes some time to return to peak performance, but City still looked in complete control throughout, even if Edison and his teammates missed the 55,000 fans pushing them on. Ao mesmo tempo que, que foi boa, é, foi meio estranho, porque é, jogar sem, sem os torcedores é, é completamente diferente. É, parece que a gente está jogando um, um jogo amistoso. E, mas, é, infelizmente, tem que ser dessa maneira, porque a forma que o mundo, o mundo vive hoje sobre essa pandemia é, é muito complicado, é muito perigoso. Não? 
Então, acho que como os times, a Premier, todos, todos que estão em volta da, do futebol estão tomando as devidas precauções. E é claro, é para nossa proteção e para a proteção de todos também. Uma boa vitória jogando um bom futebol. Depois de três, três longos meses de, de paragem, eu acho que o time voltou bem, é, voltamos com, com a mesma qualidade. É claro que a, que a intensidade ali acabou afetando um pouco ao, em alguns momentos da partida, porque você vem nos três meses de paragem, é muito difícil você jogar o primeiro jogo assim num, numa alta intensidade grande, como o nosso time joga, é, é difícil. Mas eu acho que o time se comportou bem, é, tivemos um, uma boa atuação e espero que a gente possa dar continuidade. On behalf of everyone at City, we stand together with the fight against racism. This is a moment for all of us to use our platforms. And our voice to speak up and do more. Let's work together for a better and more equal future. Black Lives Matter. Now, Michael and Paul, I'd love to get your opinion also. So we've already talked about Rodri. We've already talked um, about Phil Foden. But another player that starts this evening is Bernardo Silva. Now, he actually has the most appearances joint with Ilkay Gundogan in the team this season. Of course, he came back from having that really super busy summer where he was playing in the Nations League as well. Um, do you think that the break actually might have helped him perhaps recover a bit from that fatigue that he was going through? Well, I'll go on that. I mean, just the, you just have to look at the energy that Bernardo Silva puts into his game, the stats that he covers, the ground he covers. It's just an amazing, amazing athlete. So the amount of games that he's going on to play, as you've mentioned, would take its toll. So that little bit of a rest would, would hopefully do him good. We'll see the best of him going forward. I think he's approaching around 100 games for Manchester City now into age 25. I just love the, the, the flexibility that he brings. He, we're talking about which areas he can play on the pitch. He can play wide. He can play any of the midfield, you know, the two attacking ones in front of Rodri or Fernandinho. So I think he's been a, a super addition to the squad. And I think last year we've seen the best of him when there was no Kevin De Bruyne. So personally, you know, that type of player in your team, that's what you want week in, week out. And Paul, we were talking um, earlier about the, the team for tonight. How can you see Bernardo Silva fitting in tonight? Where do you think he's going to be playing? He'll play alongside David Silva and in front of Rodri. You know, and I'll reiterate what, what, what Brownie's just said there. I, I love him, Bernardo. I mean, who doesn't love Bernardo Silva? Um, but he's he's what great in what he brings to the team. Even even when he's not at his best, you know, we all know he's a wonderfully talented player. You know, technically he's fantastic, but. Um, the way Man City play when they've not got the ball um, and wanting to press and win it back high up the pitch, nine times out of ten, when he plays in that middle role, he's he's the catalyst that goes and pushes on to the defenders to close them down and everybody else falls in behind them. But, um, but yeah, I think tonight possibly we'll see Phil Foden, as we have done recently this season, playing wider on the left, um, maybe tucking in a little bit. Bernardo David, obviously, in the middle. And Mares, who's been as fantastic this season as well, on the right-hand side, cutting in on his left foot. Yeah, and we're so blessed that we're able to talk about so many different world-class players that we get to see and so many changes for tonight as well. Um, and of course, changes from the game against Arsenal in a game in which you will have noticed that the team wore their shirts with the Citizens Giving for Recovery logo across the front. Now, this is a... Excuse me, this is a campaign that involves all nine clubs are from the City Football Group. We're raising money, bringing people together, all of the staff, volunteering time, trying to get communities back on their feet. We've been supporting the emergency COVID-19 response through almost £1 million worth of donations. We are now aiming to deliver an additional £1 million of support by introducing Citizens Giving for Recovery. All around the world, together, we have been facing a health emergency. Heroes have risen to challenges they had never imagined. Many have suffered enormous loss. Now it's time to help our communities get back on their feet.
Now is the time for City Football Group. Our nine clubs, thousands of staff and millions of fans to make a difference. Giving our time, giving our expertise, giving our resources and giving our voice. Now is the time to come back together for recovery. Today, we can look forward and make a positive difference. Citizens giving for recovery. Get involved. Donate now. absolutely incredible campaign that we're all super super proud of now as i said before we want you to get involved with our show tonight we want you to share your pictures share your predictions you can do it on your social media channels using the hashtag wnrh and we're seeing a few up here on our screen just now loving the face paint somebody's having their dinner before the show starts and, and of course we want to see your father's day shout outs and pictures as well um we love it. We want to see the backdrops as well. We're loving seeing how you have dressed. In the last nine games, I think Burnley will be looking for... Uh, some fans are looking for Europe. Um, I think that's probably going to be a bit of a push too far myself, obviously. I think, obviously, it depends as well on, on City's um, appeal in Europe as well, on, on, on where we'll finish it. And if we get into Europe, I think it might be eighth, depending on who wins the Cups. But I personally think, obviously, we've got to go to City. Obviously, we're doing that tonight. We've got to go to Liverpool as well. And we've got some tough games. We've got Sheffield United at home and things like that. So, I think just consolidate, try and not... Um, finish mid-table and we're not going to get dragged into relegation really so it's just going to be a case of probably just consolidating that mid-table position I personally would like to see us finish in the top 10 because um, obviously I, you've got to set yourself a target and if I think Europe's too far try and get yourself into top 10 and, and then consolidate and then and then push on next season hopefully available but yeah there's a lot of players out for Burnley tonight and the squad's thin enough as it is and then obviously you've got Aaron Lennon who's not signed his new deal which would have seen him till the end of this season obviously not a new deal per se but would have seen him stay at Burnley to the end of this season Joe Hart won't be staying beyond the end of June either so that this thin squad which has got thinner because of the injuries is going to get even thinner now because players are leaving so it's a thin squad and we're going uh, and and these sort of this sort of scenario that we're in now you're going to need a big the, the, the teams with the bigger squads it's going to it's going to not help but it's going to be better for them and obviously that Burnley probably got the thinnest squad in the Premier League which has now become even thinner so these next next month or so it's, it's going to be interesting definitely but, but yeah a bit of an injury crisis definitely I personally never look forward to trips to the Etihad for obvious reasons. Uh, we, we do normally get tanked at the Etihad, or I've get I've got tanked quite often. And but weirdly, it's one of the grounds with us being so close. Obviously, Burnley Manchester is not far away. You can get a, a forty minute train. Uh, it's one that I pretty much go to every single season. I would have been there tonight, but obviously, obviously, none, none of us can go. Um, but but yeah, it's not something we look forward to. Let's be honest. Um, there's a couple of memories. A couple of memories. of Kevin McDonald, ninetieth minute equaliser. Um, I were there for that one. That that were. That were class. Um, so there are a couple of memories, but it's not it's not a game you look forward to as a Burnley fan. It's just a case of getting there. Some Burnley fans are thinking, hey, you never know, lockdown, we, we might nick a draw, something like that. But I think most Burnley fans are real and just say, look, just not get tanked again, maybe. 2-0, we'll probably take it. Yeah, so my name's Joseph Redmond. I'm from Turfcast Podcast. It's obviously a Burnley Football Club podcast that I've been running for a couple of years. We're on, obviously, all the social media channels. Just search Turfcast Podcast. We are on YouTube as well. We do a lot of videos, uh, and the podcast is available on all your podcast apps. Again, just search Turfcast Podcast, and you can get in touch with us there. So that's Joe Redmond, part of the City Chat programme. You can uh, get every single week uh, here. We're not really here. It's City against Burnley from eight o'clock this evening. I'm Hugh Ferris. Uh, Natalie Pavlek's with us too, as well as Paul Dickoff 
and Michael Brown. We'll come to the two guys in just a moment, but we wanted to bring in a City fan who is watching and listening and getting ready for the game all the way out in Brooklyn in the States. So Robert, are you there? Robert Rossiconi, come in, Robert, and tell us. Uh, you have, I think, your son there with you as well. So what was his Father's Day gift for you? Uh, his presents. And uh, actually, I was I was tagged on Instagram once by Liam Gallagher. So he printed me up a shirt with Liam tagging me in it, which uh, was kind of cool. And I uh, got that for a Father's Day gift this year. It was wonderful. Well, in, in that case, three points to him for everything that he has achieved over the course of the last 24 hours. Tell us a little bit about your viewing experience and uh, how different it may well be. I appreciate that you might have NBC on hook around the corner at, uh, just out of vision, but how much have you enjoyed uh, football returning and soccer returning to you in the States? Oh, it's football and, and it, it feels like a patch has been put over my heart. Uh, it's been a really tough three months, especially here in New York City. Um, We've, we've lost someone close to us to the virus and uh, just seeing seeing the boys back on the pitch uh, doing what they do. And, and I, I'll be honest, it doesn't look like they missed a beat uh, on uh, on uh, Wednesday against Arsenal. Uh, so it, it really it, it was comforting to see the boys back on the pitch. And, you know, we're just over the over the blue moon for it. So many fans all the way around the world uh, are enjoying Manchester City from afar. Some of the rest of us who are normally lucky enough to watch Manchester City a little bit closer by are having to go the same thing. Uh, Paul Dickov has been to pretty much everywhere on behalf of Manchester City in trophy tours, frankly, on jollies over the course of the last couple of years. <laughs> Paul, have you met Robert? Have you been to Brooklyn? Have you two uh, had the opportunity to chat City? Yeah, well, I've been to New York a couple of times um, and actually done um, a Q&A for the, the New York Supporters Club last night. Um, so I don't know if Robert was involved in that or not, but yet again, through City in the community, raising money, um, which was amazing. But yeah, I've been to New York a few times, um, amongst other places, and it's not a jolly hue. It's really hard work when you're doing it. Trust me on that. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, the, the trust, I think, has fallen down a little for the stories that you bring back from your travels. And Robert, um, I appreciate <laughs> that sometimes an age thing, particularly when you're concerning Paul Dickov, because he's getting on in years a little bit. But um, your memories, how far do they go back of Manchester City? Well, I, I, when I saw that uh, uh, Paul was on here, I, I kind of got a little tingle <laughs> because um, I, I remember being a college student uh, listening on internet to the 99 playoff final i got the shirt behind me uh and the the feed kept going in and out i guess you guys would know a little bit about that now um but uh his his uh match tire in the late in the game the 90 93rd minute 94th minute was just i mean i, I it was going in and out in and out and i hear dick off scores and i just lost it i woke up the entire dormitory uh <laughs> screaming and jumping around and then it went out for most of the penalty shootout and um, I just happened to catch the last kick that uh, Nicky Weaver stopped. And uh, I, I've been a city supporter since the dark old days, if you will. Um, so for, for me, typical city means something very different than it does for this guy. So uh, <laughs> it's, it's been a, a pleasure to roller coaster. Uh, yeah, I bet. And uh, it is as much as we read about it. It is for us, too. And, and perhaps we could go round the horn now and get, a, get ourselves a prediction for tonight's game. Manchester City against Burnley is an eight o'clock kickoff. We're not really here, but they uh, will be uh, from eight o'clock. And it was so impressive against Arsenal, wasn't it, Michael? And uh, City, I wonder if they benefit from these kind of strange circumstances in that they have a football system, a football style that is kind of translatable and it works in whatever atmosphere. So do you think we'll see more of the same tonight? What do you think will happen? Well, I was asked for a prediction and I've sort of gone out. I thought it'd be a, a big result for Manchester City. I said 4-1 and um, you know, you just got to consider that the depth that Manchester City have. We've seen the squad now, eight changes, still extremely strong. And you, know, you go to the Carabao Cup final with Zinchenko, Rodri, David Silva, Phil Ford and down on that left-hand side, so we could see a similar setup. So we've seen it in a cup final, we've seen it against Burnley. So, you know, it's a fantastic squad and um, you know, I'm sure that's what benefits. But once they control the ball, as you said, the style at Manchester City play, that becomes a great advantage for them. And I'm sure they'll be able to move it around with, with great ease against this Burnley side, but it's just a matter of having that pace and that power in the, the final third to hurt them very, very early if they can. Paul, we've spoken a lot uh, about all sorts of things because of this 
started Premier League. And one of them is home advantage, not necessarily meaning as much as it might do because of the lack of fans. But for Manchester City, being at home, having those creature comforts against a team who have not often prospered at the Etihad, you could sense that the home advantage would be pretty much the same for City tonight, won't it? Yeah, well, then, you know, go back to what I said at the start and, and after the Arsenal game, you know, I was so impressed with the teams have really struggled um, to, to get themselves into it over the last um, week or so. And, you know, some of the football they played last week was amazing. Um, I'm sure from now in the last in the last eight Premier League games, we're going to see a lot of changes within the squad because, you know, the, the, the club, City and Pep, that they're going to use this as a catalyst for the Champions League game against Real Madrid. You know, so the more they can rest people up, keep people fresh, and gain that bit of momentum um, from last week into tonight and, and the games I've got coming up. They're just a fantastic team. I mean, the, the bench tonight's ridiculous, isn't it, really? When you look at the players that are on the bench, they would, they would get into any team in the Premier League just about, and they have the luxury of doing that and the quality that they've got coming onto the pitches. I'm looking forward to it tonight. I can see another comfortable one. Yeah, we'll talk perhaps afterwards about how the five substitutions is working because it's another aspect that is a little bit alien, certainly to those watching. I'd imagine it's pretty alien to those having to make the decisions about who to bring on and when. Robert, tell us what you think about uh, what will happen tonight and uh, would it be another Father's Day present for you to have a nice three points for City? I, th I definitely think we're going to catch the three points. Uh, how many goals we score, I think, will depend on how early we can put one behind uh, behind the Burnley defense. Uh, if we score an early goal, I think it, it could open the floodgates. Uh, uh, but I, I'm calling for a 4 0 victory for City. And I think Phil Foden's going to shine. He's, he's just dying for his chance to get out there and score goals. And you saw that in the uh, 15 minutes he was out there on Wednesday. So I think, uh, I think 4 0 should be comfortable. Um, if we score early, it might be more. All right. Well, it's been great to hear from you and uh, we hope you enjoy the rest of your day. You've got a lot more of the rest of your day, haven't you, uh, to come. That's Robert in Brooklyn. And Natalie, perhaps we can uh, end our conversation about predictions uh, with you. We don't often ask you for what you think will happen over the course of a, a Premier League game or indeed a match at the Etihad. So go on, then. it's time for you to stick your neck out. Yeah, I mean, I'm, go I'm going with all the guys on this one. We have such a phenomenal record against Burnley and Peppers has such a phenomenal record against Burnley. I almost don't want to tell you some of the stats that I was reading today because it feels like I might jinx us and... I don't want people coming on the show after saying she shouldn't have said that. But our record against Burnley is absolutely phenomenal. And I think it really does benefit us as well, of course, that we've already played a game. This is Burnley's first game. As you said, the last team to play. We already know what it's like to play behind closed doors. We already know how fit our players are. Burnley, I, you know, I have to say, I, I probably feel quite sorry for them coming out of the lockdown. Their first game is us at home. Um, and I think I'm expecting a pretty solid performance and a solid win from us. And I'm, I'm going to say 3-0. Yeah, it's tough to get the rust out of your system at the Etihad against Manchester City for any team, isn't it? So that's to come from eight o'clock. Just a reminder, if you're watching on mancity.com, you can stay on this stream and listen to commentary uh, from the Etihad. Our stream, however, will end on all the other platforms in just about five minutes time. The players are coming out at the Etihad. Uh, they are making themselves ready and all the rigmarole that follows these new conditions is being followed for a second time at the Etihad. It has been an extraordinary three months, hasn't it? And so many people at Manchester City, beyond the playing staff, have done so much work to make it suitable and ready for the playing staff to eventually return and, of course, now uh, return to the field. City TV have been uh, running a documentary called Project Restart, City Restart, and episode three is to come. Here's a little teaser. It's just a total different feel to a normal match day. Like this is good. It was good to be back at the Etihad. Today was just the beginning. So we don't have much time for the for the first game now. Pep likes very simple, very fresh food. So in this situation, it's uh, it's weird, but I think after two or three games, we'll be normal. We just needed to make the fans part of it. We've had no Premier League football for 99 days and the wait is almost over.
So there we go. City Restart. It's been a fascinating documentary, certainly for the four guys on the screen right now. And Natalie, of course, we know what the situation is like at the Etihad and the CFA. It's remarkable to see the changes that have happened mm. there. So, yes, check out City Restart. That is on all the normal platforms. And uh, if you're lucky enough to be in the UK, you can watch it on television uh, as well. Let's just remind you, shall we, of the two teams for tonight's game. Manchester City against Burnley is just about five and a bit minutes away. If you were here earlier, you will know that there are eight changes for Manchester City. Eight changes, so just three players uh, retaining their spots in the starting 11 uh, for the Wednesday night game against the Arsenal. Um, the game will be started by Edison in goal, Cancelo, Fernandinho, Otamendi and Zinchenko across the back. Rodri is the pivot in midfield with Bernardo Silva and David Silva in midfield ahead of him. Mares and Foden we expect to be either side of Sergio Aguero. And the Burnley team, um, we haven't been able to bring you that yet, but we can tell you that it's uh, Nick Pope in goal, Matt Lowton and Ben Mee, James Tarkovsky and Charlie Taylor across the back. Ashley Westwood, Josh Brownhill, Jack Cork and Dwight McNeil in midfield with Mattis Vidra and Jay Rodriguez up front. They are missing their two star strikers, Ashley Barnes and Chris Wood as well. Listen, thanks so much uh, for joining us. We'll be back after the game, but we are not really here. And now we're gone. Enjoy the game. season started with so much hope, so much promise. We saw glimpses of the magical, the magnificent. Momentum was building, another glittering prize already won. We had so much still to play for. And then... The season stopped. Everything, everywhere, stopped. Time stood still. But so many stood strong. Our support turned to those on the front line. We missed family. We missed friends. We missed our city. Slowly, step by step, they began to come back. Ready to go, switched on, focused. Some things will have to be different. Some things will never change. Because right now, we're not really here. But for this team, for this club, for this badge, for this city, wherever we are, will always be there.